Um, okay. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have uh, Mark Halpert here. Um, as you all know, I, there's a lot of reasons why I'm very happy to be outside of Washington, uh, particularly in election years. Uh, the preoccupation with the, the inside and outside of uh, the election campaigns can sometimes be overwhelming. But everybody needs a little dose of it from now, from time to time. And there is nobody better positioned, really, to give you a dose of it than Mark. I mean, Mark is, I hope you won't take this in, in negative sense, the consummate insider. Boy, if anybody knows what's really going on, it's Mark. Um, his career as a, as a political journalist and commentator has been one of which he started out as a, a very young guy who quickly established himself as uh, having both insight and access, which is a wonderful combination for uh, a political journalist. Uh, and he's been around and, and uh, uh, been one of the, uh, the boys on the bus and the plane and everything else that uh, goes with campaigns. So he's seen it from the ground up and also seen it from the heights. He's a person who's had great uh, access to senior policymakers over the years, somebody widely expected. And, and as I say, I mean, the consummate insider and, and even people who are at the, the very kind of tightest circles of what's going on are usually calling out Mark to find out what it is that they, they should know but don't. Um, his uh, uh, pioneering work when he established the note um, really was kind of transformed the, the kind of the online uh, inside access, uh, which had the virtue of both being timely but also factual most of the time. And so uh, obviously it had its share of good gossip, but it also had its share of great insight into the political process. Um, and he really is somebody who is, on the one hand, uh, you know, understands the folkways of Washington, but also, I think, fair to say, really committed to the values of both the profession of journalism and also doing this kind of reporting not from a gutcha point of view, but for somebody who really has a great belief in wanting to see good governance and a belief that the kind of reporting that he does and informing the American people is contributing to that enterprise. And, and that's why I so value his work and value his friendship and uh, why I'm so delighted that we're able to, uh, to host Mark Halpern uh, from ABC uh, here today. And Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Steinberg. Um, as uh, to paraphrase uh, or steal a joke rather from uh, Lamar Alexander, thank you for that nice introduction. You read it just the way I wrote it. <laughs> now that is, I promise, the last Lamar Alexander joke I'll tell because he's not known as that funny. I see a few people here from the talk I gave just a little while ago, and they're going to have to sit through the same jokes that I told before because uh, I only have a few of them, and most of them are not from Lamar Alexander. I'm just going to talk for a little bit. Uh, because um, I'd rather answer your questions. I'm really uh, delighted and honored that so many of you would spend your, your lunch here. Uh, and uh, when we go to questions, you can ask anything you want uh, about politics or media or, or any other thing. I can, I can address all. I generally tend to get some of the same questions over and over again, so let me answer two of them now. Yes, she can, and I have no idea whether he will or not. <laughs> so you don't need to ask those two. Um, let me do what I always do before I speak. I'll ask a couple questions. Uh, to get a sense. First of all, who's either live blogging or plans to go blog this later on today? Nobody. All right. So when it shows up on a blog, I'll know that not all students are honest. Uh, you know, when I speak before more than five people these days, I, I tend to assume that somebody's going to blog it. And often uh, bloggers inexplicably take some of the things I say out of context. Um, so just in case uh, one of you didn't hear or, or plans to change your mind, I'm going to talk uh, both in talking and then in answering questions about generally what is rather than what ought to be. So when I, when I say something, it doesn't mean I'm endorsing it. If I say Matt Drudge is powerful in the American political process, it doesn't necessarily mean I think it's a good thing. It just means that's my analysis of the way things are. So please don't take uh, the tone of my voice or the words I use to mean that I'm endorsing something. Uh, if you want to clarify and ask me whether I think something's good, ask me. If I say Karl Rove is a good political strategist, that doesn't necessarily mean I support the war in Iraq. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't. It just doesn't necessarily mean that I do. So again, jump to that conclusion. Um, I want to I'll get a sense of who you all are. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a vote. If you're uncomfortable voting in front of other people, close your eyes when you vote. Um, who, here, who here supported President Bush for election in 2000 or 2004, whether you either voted for him or, or supported him? Uh, congratulations. By the standards of Austin, you're a very diverse group. That's, it's good to see a wide variety of viewpoints. Uh, thank you for the brave people who raised your hands. Uh, when I was on a book tour last year, and I would speak to audiences around the country, uh, I, would, I would do that uh, poll. And I did it in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Harvard Bookstore and about 
a crowd of about this size, about 12 people raised their hands, and I said, congratulations, by the standards of Cambridge, you're a very diverse group. Then I went out to Berkeley, and a, a crowd a little, a, a little smaller than this, and I asked how many people here voted for or supported George Bush in 2000 and 2004, and no one raised their hand, at which point you couldn't really say, congratulations, you're a very diverse group, because by that standards, they weren't diverse at all. But they were representative of the country uh, in this respect. We have become a pretty divided country. There's a big debate in politics and political journalism about how divided we are. Is the divide amongst Washington consultants and between Fox News Channel and the New York Times, or is the divide out in the country, real divisions on big issues? The book I wrote last year called The Way to Win about presidential campaigns, and, and the topic I'm supposed to talk about is Bush, Clinton, Bush, question mark, uh, was about how the political families, these two political families, the Clintons and the Bushes, have has, had a stranglehold on the White House for 20 years. If Senator Clinton wins, not impossible, um, and wins, serves two terms, that would be 28 years of two families if Jeb Bush succeeded her. Um, 36 years, pretty incredible. Incredible even now, um, uh, uh, as, as two families have had three consecutive presidencies, two for two terms each. That's a pr pretty extraordinary thing. And the question is, what do they know that the other candidates don't know, the other political fam families don't know? The Bush family, George Bush and Karl Rove and the others who they worked with uh, here in Austin and now in Washington, and then the Bush, uh, the Clinton political family, uh, the Clintons and their political advisors. The Clintons believe, Bill Clinton believes, who we interviewed for the book with my co-author, he believes the country is actually not divided. The people in Austin and Seattle and, and uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, actually think largely the same thing about issues as people in more conservative parts of the country, and that the divisions are caused by the chattering class in Washington, people who uh, look for divisions, who make their living, like Ann Coulter and Michael Moore off the divisions, people who get reelected uh, in congressional districts that are gerrymandered, uh, people who get donations from people who are liberal if they're Democrats or conservative if they're Republicans. Carl Rove and, and George Bush have a different view, and, and we interviewed Carl for the book, and he said as much. They believe there are big fundamental divisions in the country and that the point of power in the presidency is to get in there with whatever minimum requirements you need, 50.001% uh, of the popular vote or just to pick a number of random, five Supreme Court justices, whatever it takes to get into power and then change the country in the direction you want to change it, to, to take that division and to push policy to more reflect where you think the country is and where the country should go. The fact that most universities I go speak to uh, when I ask who supported the president, it's generally, even, even in more conservative schools, uh, it, it tends to be that kind of level of support for the president. Universities and young people, as you all know, are, tend, to, tend to be more liberal. Uh, as you get older, some of you may vote Republican. But, um, but the divide is not, is not unusual. And so as these candidates, the current candidates, think about who's going to fill in that question mark, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton, who's going, who's going to be the one to succeed? One of the main questions they have to answer is which is the right view of the country today? Is it a more centrist view? Is it a view that says you can find things that unite the country and you should run on those, even in trying to win the nomination? Or is it a more conservative or more liberal view? One of the things you hear from Democrats all the time, or I should say you heard from Democrats all the time before the, 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 uh, the car row of uh, uh, cattle futures went down and people thought maybe he wasn't the right model, was we need our own Karl Rove. My book opens in 2004, at the, uh, right after the election, when President Bush won re-election. James Carville had said if George Bush won re-election, it would be the singular political achievement of his lifetime, and, and President Bush did win. Democrats said, we need our own Karl Rove. On that stage at the Clinton Library opening, right after the election, were Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Senator Clinton. And Democrats were saying, the way we're going to win in 2008 is to have our own Karl Rove. And part of what they meant was tactical things how to manipulate the media, how to drive a message, how to frame your candidate in positive ways and the opposition in negative ways. But part of what they meant was, we want to change the country in a radical way. Radical meaning fundamental, not, not uh, extreme. We want to make the kind of liberal change in the judiciary and public policy uh, in a liberal way, the way George Bush and Karl Rove had done in a conservative way. We don't want another eight-year presidency, some would say, headed by a Clinton, in which we don't have universal health care, we don't have different kinds of judges, we don't have uh, an expansion of civil rights and human rights, we don't have a foreign policy guided by different things, we don't have a, a fundamental change in environmental policy. We want a, a, someone who's as liberal and as skillful as Karl Rove and George Bush were conservative and skillful. So 
there's, there's two questions there. One is about getting elected. What's the best way to get elected? Now, when George Bush got elected, and, and let me say the second question is how to govern. When George Bush got elected in 1999-2000, in, in he ran more like Bill Clinton. He talked about being a different kind of Republican. He talked about change in immigration policy. He went from a Republican Party that had talked about abolishing the Department of Education in 1996 to advocating an expanded role for the Department of Education and No Child Left Behind. Once he got into office and in running for re-election, he, he went back to that, what we call in the book, a more Bush politics attitude, which was a more conservative attitude and an attitude of saying, I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to be just popular and powerful enough to change the country in a conservative direction. Now, the Iraq war has, has changed that calculus as it's changed everything in our politics. And clearly, the 2008 election will be framed by the Iraq war as the biggest issue. I, I have no doubt, no matter what happens to the president's policy over the next few months. But all the candidates have to decide, how do they want to run? What's the best way to win? And then if they get in office, how do they want to govern? Do they want to govern in the center? Do they want to nominate candidates for their cabinet and people for the judiciary that are more centrist? Do they want to build centrist coalitions like Bill Clinton built on NAFTA and on welfare reform, where you lose votes on the two extremes, but you win enough in the center to, to, to pass the majority? Or do they want to govern more like George Bush has, who governed on the center on No Child Left Behind and, and on uh, tax cuts to some extent, not as, not as broad a partisan coalition, but with some Democratic votes, or more the way Bush has governed m for most of his presidency, where you put together votes for budgets and for policy changes that are off on one side. If you look at the history of the, of the major candidates, and I think there are seven major candidates right now in the two parties, I don't like to have the press play the role of, of saying who's a real candidate and who's not, but you have to be realistic about who's presented the ideas, who's raised the money, who's built the national coalition and important early state coalitions. I think the seven, uh, uh, Edwards, Clinton, Obama on the Democratic side, Giuliani, Thompson, McCain, Romney. Did I say Romney twice? No. Okay. On the Republican side, I think those seven have the best chance. If you look at their careers, the majority of them have been so-called Clinton-style, Clinton politics candidates, candidates whose rhetoric and policy positions have been in the center. Senator McCain has probably been the most oriented that way of all, of all seven of them and continues to be to a large extent despite a lot of reports about his pandering to the right in some symbolic ways and in some issue positions. For the most part, he has been a Clinton-style, Clinton politics candidate. Senator Clinton, Senator Obama have, in their, in their short time in national life, have been that way as well. Um, Governor Romney in Massachusetts was that way. Mayor Giuliani in New York was that way. Uh, partly out of necessity because they were, they were, they were the chief executives of, with very democratic legislative bodies and, and constituencies. But that was their inclination before. As presidential candidates, they've moved more to Bush politics, as have Senator Clinton, Senator Obama, and Senator Edwards. Those five uh, have been largely, before they ran for president, in Clinton style, looking for centrist compromise in the middle, working in bipartisan coalition. Not always. These are not absolutes. But as candidates have, been, have gone more to the extreme, on the case of um, uh, Fred Thompson, it's a little early to say, but he's mostly been a conservative and, and is running as a conservative, and that's part of the rationale of his candidacy. Because, of course, part of the reason why there's pressure if, if, uh, to be a Bush politics candidate, uh, candidate is because the party nomination processes are dominated by, on the right, conservatives, on the left, and the Democratic Party liberals. And so the trick is, I would argue, to get elected is to be a more centrist candidate, even running for the nomination, partly because uh, in this age of YouTube and Nexus and Google, it's hard to switch. If you take some positions or, or build some alliances to win the nomination, hard to then scamper back to the center because people are going to say you're a flip-flopper. Also because while voters are, and activists are very ideological, they also are very result-oriented and sophisticated. They want to win. And they know that a candidate in the center Clinton 92, Bush 2000, is more likely to win an election. Hillary Clinton, I believe, has the best chance of being president now. First of all, the, she's the Democratic front runner, and the Democrats, by all accounts, even my Republican sources will tell you, are favored to win the election. I'm no logician, but if you're the most likely Democrat and the Democrats are most likely to win, you're probably the most likely to be the next president. But there's another reason why, which is she has studied the Bush and Clinton models more closely than anyone. She has learned the tactical and strategic ways that George Bush and Bill Clinton won four straight elections. And she's picked kind of a la carte from them, not just in terms of whether she should be a Bush politics or Clinton politics candidate. That's a pretty fundamental choice, a big choice. But in smaller tactical things, how to use the new media, 
how to use the old media, how to organize a campaign, um, how to uh, communicate with voters, how to uh, target voters. Very sophisticated. She's expected she'd be the best funded candidate. She's pretty surprised that she's not. But w with that one exception, she's been a strong front runner, and she's played a lot of the same cards that she saw her husband play successfully twice and George W. Bush play successfully twice. So if I had to fill in that question mark now, I'd say Hillary Clinton. But, and this is where I'll end, this is going to be a close election. The war uh, in Iraq, national security, war on terror, produce a very uh, uncertain environment. It's the first time since the 1920s we don't have an incumbent president or vice president seeking the office. Even the strongest Democratic candidate or the strongest Republican candidate is unlikely to put too many of the states in play that are red or blue on the other side. I think both parties will probably start with 220 electoral votes, maybe 230 electoral votes minimum, putting either candidate in a position to get to 270. So it'll probably be close. If you know an, a, a contest, whether it's sports or or, uh, or politics or anything else, if you know it's going to be close, it makes it harder to be confident about the outcome because anything at the end could tip the balance. So I'm, I'm not saying Senator Clinton's a prohibitive favorite, but I do think she's the most likely. And uh, I'm sure in response to your questions about some of the other candidates, uh, we'll get into what the others would have to do to, to either beat her for the nomination or, or in a general election matchup, and I'm happy to answer those. But let me stop there and uh, take your questions. I will say, since nobody gave me instructions in advance, as I normally get, uh, I'm happy to listen to speeches, but sometimes I gather other people aren't. So uh, feel free to give, you, give your speech in the mirror when you get home, but ask me a question. I'm happy to answer it, and if you feel you have to ask a, a follow-up, I'm, I'm happy to entertain that as well. Uh, if people don't like what's going on, we'll do it kind of American Idol style. You can start to hiss, and then we'll move on. But I, don't want, I, don't, I, want, I want people to get to ask, and, and if, if the last set class I did is any indication, I often will misunderstand your question. So if I got it wrong, rather than let me bull forward answering the wrong question, stop me and tell me I, I misunderstood. Yes, ma'am. I will. I'd urge you to buy my book. Not, <laughs> not just because my co-author has three young children who need to go to college someday, but because I, because I can't lay them all out here um, uh, in the detail that, that we do in the book. Um, one of the things she's done very smartly is, is have a much more disciplined operation than her husband had. Um, I covered Bill Clinton for a long time, and you could, when anything controversial was happening, you could always get someone to say on background and sometimes on the record, aren't we idiots? Um, you know, Clinton, they would call him, not Governor Clinton or President Clinton. Clinton doesn't know what he's doing. I wanted to do it a different way, but, but the other strategists wanted to do it that, that way. We're in a lot of trouble. Oh, my God. You never, almost never see that in George Bush's White House. Now, you've seen more of it as things have gone wrong, but you'd see very little of it. And you see almost none of it in Hillary Clinton's uh, time. The recent controversy she's had over this guy who raised money for her, um, there have been a few quotes like that. Now, reporters are sometimes uh, not totally uh, uh, I won't say honest, but they take liberties. And, and I suspect that some of these blind quotes, if you look at the identification, they don't say a member of her campaign staff or even a Clinton advisor. They'll often say, you know, a supporter. So, you know, you get somebody on the subway who says, I'm for Hillary Clinton, and boy, this fundraising thing's horrible. Probably they're not taking that much license. But there's been very, given how bad this is and given, given that I know that there was internal strife about how to handle it originally and how to handle it now, you see very little of that. Another thing she's done is to use the new media both the friendly new media as well as, um, as, well as uh, uh, less friendly new media. Because you can't dominate the New York Times and ABC News and Time Magazine the way you can dominate some more niche media. When she got the endorsement of Amb Ambassador Joe Wilson, when she got the endorsement just last week of, of Wes Clark, those endorsements were kept a secret and unveiled first to bloggers, liberal bloggers, who like Wes Clark and who like um, uh, Joe Wilson a lot. That gave them an exclusive, which bloggers like to get, and any, anyone likes to get, and it, and it made them more likely to amplify that story out. That's the kind of targeting to ideological media that Karl Rove did very effectively. Another thing is that both George Bush and Karl Rove and, and Bill Clinton know is you can't run away from your weaknesses. You have to, you have to go at your weaknesses and not hide from them. You're not going to win everybody over, but you're going to win some people over. So for instance, Hillary Clinton is pro-choice. But she gave a speech a while ago, but it's still, it's still her philosophy about this, about how people in the pro-choice community have to respect people in the pro-life community, that the country needs to look for areas of commonality, uh, that abortion should be, as her husband said, safe, legal, and rare. So 
she's not going to win over a lot of pro-life pro voters, probably, but she wants to be able to compete and win and hold down the Republican margins there. Health care, she had to put out a health care plan, but she's not running from uh, her record on health care and, and the image that she has as having failed on health care. She's out there saying, I've got, as she says all the time, I, I've fought on this issue, I have the scars to, to prove it. And, and that's another thing where other candidates might be self-conscious, but she's going out and competing because she knows within the democratic process she has to compete there. I'll just give you one more, which is they, you've got to think about the Electoral College if you want to get elected president. It, it doesn't matter if you get on Oprah or you win the popular vote, as Al Gore knows. All that matters is 270 electoral votes. So in all your scheduling and all your thinking about issues and all your thinking about, about um, uh, uh, support, you've got to think, what states am I going to win? And you have to gear your campaign towards that or you're going to end up perhaps a nominee but not the White House. Those are just the three. Um, but it's not an accident. It's not like I'm picking out uh, things and, and sort of creating a collage of the, of the things. She's studied them. She's looked at what worked for George Bush and Karl Rove. I may, not, um, I may not agree with them on what they want the country to be like, but I respect their ability, as does her husband, which, which we talked about with him for the book. I respect their ability to win elections, and that's, you know, you can't govern if you don't win. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I think he has to do one thing to win. Now, because I don't think, I think he's had some mistakes in the last few months, I no longer think he controls his own destiny, which I did a few months ago. I think a few months ago, if he had achieved this one thing, I think he would have beaten her no matter what she did. Now I think it's going to take a combination of her making mistakes and him doing this one thing. He has to convince people he can be ready, to be, he, will be, he will be ready to be president from day one. It's a very hard thing to do within the context of a presidential campaign where you're going on Tyra Banks and you're speaking at big rallies and you are going to fundraisers and you're speaking at big outdoor events where you've got to raise your voice. Um, those are not uh, environments in which you look particularly presidential. I think Oprah Winfrey can help him raise money. They can help him become better known. You know him, everybody in this room because you're interested in politics knows him, but he's not still widely known and his story is not widely known. And if she wants to help tell his story, the, the equivalent of the man from Hope, the man from Honolulu, whatever it is, she can help with that. But, but I think in, a, in, a, in an odd way, she's not good for him. She may even be bad for him because she's a pop cultural figure. Any coverage of Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey is going to be about celebrity and elective, you know, electability and treating him like a, a, a member of the book club. You know, that, is, that is not his problem. He's exciting and he's a celebrity. That's, she, she can elevate that. And, and again, she raised $3 million for him. That's not nothing. But... Um, but she undermines what I think his only problem is. He would be better off being endorsed, I think, by retired generals than by Oprah Winfrey. And when say, is he going to go on the show? Is she going to campaign for him? I'm not saying it's a net negative, but I think there are negatives with it. And, 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 and they're enhanced because no candidate, every candidate in this age has to worry, is going on Arsenio Hall and playing the saxophone a net negative or a net positive. For Bill Clinton, it worked because it was between the Cold War, end of the Cold War and 9-11, and, and, and people had a lower um, expectation about the seriousness of a president. It, it, it undermined him, and during his presidency, he recognized he needed to kind of fix that, but it wasn't a, a barrier. He also did some smart things to, to make him more credentialed. He stood with the, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Crow. That was a great endorser. If I, if I were Barack Obama, I'd rather have Admiral Crow's endorsement or another former chairman of the Joint Chiefs than Oprah's, as much attention as it gets. And, and again, he, he's talking about his experience now. I think that, that it's, it, it's a perfectly legitimate debate for, for Senator Clinton and Senator Obama and the country to have, the Democratic Party to have, is being in the state legislature and working as a community activist. Um, are those things better experienced because, as he points out, you know, Donald Rumsfeld and, and Dick Cheney had a lot of experience and he questions their decisions than, than the kind of experience Senator Clinton had. And, of course, they can debate whether being first lady is the right experience. I think that debate doesn't get him where he needs to get. He has to prove it in the course of the campaign. And, again, a campaign, a very short period of time remaining, day to day, his schedule does not include very many things that I think get him where he needs to get, and I think they have to solve that. If they solve that, and if she makes mistakes, he can win. But um, uh, it's, it's tough. I, don't, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. I w certainly wouldn't rule it out. There's one caveat to that whole long answer. 
which is increasingly it seems clear to me that the Democratic nomination is about one state. If, if Senator Clinton wins Iowa, she'll win New Hampshire, and, and she'll almost certainly be the nominee. If Barack Obama wins Iowa, I think he'll win New Hampshire, and he'll be the nominee. Senator Edwards wins. It's, it's, it's a little bit more jumbled. He's a very good team in Iowa. He's spending a lot of time there. It does, it's a state that, that um, is, is, is not particularly fond of Hillary Clinton in some ways. There are challenges for him in Iowa. He's a, he's, he's a young African-American man in a state where most of the caucus goers are not young African-American or men. Say again? Okay. Well, then you can back me up on that. Um, but but I, I wouldn't rule him out winning Iowa. And that kind of short circuits the whole thing. All these other questions, that, national questions about his experience could be short circuited if he wins, if he wins Iowa and, and then I think would win New Hampshire. What are, you, what are you looking for? Political predictions, insight, information, standards, uh, I'd recommend the website I'm launching in a few weeks that will be free. Uh, you'll know when it launches if I do a good job publicizing it. I can't, I can't say yet, but that's the one I'd recommend. Um, Bloomberg is, is, is going to do something very methodical, um, uh, which is he's going to wait till they're nominees. And when there are nominees, the major party nominees, he's going to ask himself a couple questions, several questions. One is, how unpopular are they? What, does the process of them getting nominated and beat up intra-party make their unfavorables very high? Two is, what do people think of Michael Bloomberg? Do they know who he is? Uh, uh, through focus groups and other research that he'll spend millions on, are they open to, as he says, a short Jewish billionaire from New York um, uh, being the president? And three, are they open to an independent being president? If there's an openness to all those things, then I think, I think he'll run. I think, I think that um, if you made a list of all the states that Bloomberg could win, if you listed all 50 states in the District of Columbia, in the order of likelihood, he would win them, win the electoral votes. And he'll only run if he thinks he can win. He won't run just to be a spoiler or influence the debate. I think the every one of the first ones would be blue states. I don't think there's a red state he would win. He'd be more likely to win than all of the blue states that Kerry won last time. That suggests that to win, he's going to have to really go after the Democrat to win those states. I don't think I don't think he'll be inclined to do that. If the nominees are Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani, I think he there's a decent chance he'll run. I think their unfavorables will be very high. I think there'd probably be a fourth candidate in the race who might allow him to win some electoral votes, and it would take New York off the table. I think New York is a big problem for him, but if he's running against two other New Yorkers, I think that's possible. The other would be uh, maybe a John Edwards and a, and a Mitt Romney or a Fred Thompson, two candidates who have positioned themselves more at the extreme. If he runs, he will run as a competent, problem-solving centrist, even though most of his issue positions, not all, but most are to the left. The best way to take up that space and where the most space would exist is with the candidates on the extreme. In the end, the chance that he'll meet all his conditions, he'll get the candidates he needs, he'll look at it and say, Spending a uh, billion dollars, which is, I believe, what he would spend or close to it, could allow me to win 270 electoral votes. I think it's not that high. It's not impossible, but I don't think it's that high. Right. There's no solution for 2008. Um, I don't know how it's going to end up. My guess is Iowa caucuses will be uh, January 3rd or 5th, um, and New Hampshire will be uh, January 8th, if that's a Tuesday. Um, I think that's the day that's a Tuesday. So there'll be a much smaller window there, and then and then after that, Michigan on the 15th and, and so forth. Um, I'm a big believer in Iowa and New Hampshire, um, playing, a big, uh, playing a large role in the process, being influential. They're not diverse states. It's, it's intrinsically unfair to have two states play a big role over and over again. But it, it, unless you've been on the ground in those states during a presidential campaign, it's impossible to appreciate how more advanced and developed the political media culture is there than anywhere else. This is an incredibly impressive number of people to come listen to politics during the day. But let's face it, you're students. You'd be napping or playing video games or <laughs> illegally downloading music if you weren't here. For, for most voters, you'd be, you'd be at work. And in Iowa New Hampshire, people turn out for town meetings. They follow the candidates. They ask serious issues. The Des Moines Register 
and a television station, WMUR in New Hampshire, uh, cover the candidates substantively. WMUR uh, in New Hampshire has done a, a series of sub substantive interviews with the candidates that they air on, on broadcast television and put on their website. Um, uh, the, the, the civics groups are interested. They really put the candidates through their paces, and they're small states, so you can get around the state. And you couldn't do that in Texas. You couldn't do that in Michigan. So there's, you could argue both sides, but I think having those states early is a good thing for the process. I think the solution that most people in public life look to, which I don't, I don't think is a bad idea, let them go first. Again, not everybody's for that, but I would say let them go first, and then have regional primaries that rotate every four years. So you do Iowa, New Hampshire, and then a southern primary one year. Uh, makes it easier for the candidates to, to see voters in those other states because they wouldn't have to be going from Seattle to Miami as they do now. Um, then do a, a Midwestern and kind of like the NCA brackets. Um, and then rotate, you know, let the East go first one year and, and, uh, and spread it out once a month. You'd have, you'd have a, a, a regional primary. I think something like that, there'll be an effort to get something like that. The, the, the sad thing is this was the cycle for that to be fixed because there's no incumbent running. The reason why Iowa and New Hampshire always keep their position and the reason why it's hard to fix is because the incumbent president never wants to piss off Iowa and New Hampshire. Because Iowa and New Hampshire generally has gotten them in the White House, even if they didn't win them both. And incumbents don't like uncertainty. They want to control what they can control. And they figure if they know Iowa and New Hampshire first, they can campaign real hard there, give ambassadorships to people, send a lot of federal money there, visit there occasionally, hold those states, and, and ensure that they won't have a nomination challenge. We'll have an incumbent president leading into the next cycle whether that's Hillary Clinton, Mitt Romney, or anyone else, they'll likely favor Iowa and New Hampshire. They'll be under a lot of pressure. It'll make it harder to change. And, and to state what probably for most of you is obvious, the reason this is so hard to fix is because there's so many interested parties. In most states, the, the date of a primary caucus is set by a combination of the state legislature. Uh, well, every state's different, but they're set by a combination of state legislature and the parties, just the state legislature, just the parties. The national parties have rules that the states uh, have to adhere to. You can't really get every, you literally couldn't find a room big enough to get everybody in the room who had a piece of this to argue it out because every state's got a different agenda. People within the states have a different agenda. Sometimes states don't hold their contests on the same date. Um, so it's a hard thing to fix and I'm not very optimistic that it will be fixed even though there's never been this much of an outcry about the chaos. The chaos isn't great for people like me who have to book hotel rooms. It's not great for the candidates, but it is a level playing field. Nobody's, nobody's at any advantage about, about the, with the uncertainty. Um, and so I, even though I don't like it personally, I'm not sure it's as, as, as much a crisis for our democracy as the editorial writers uh, frame it to be because at some point there'll be votes and people will vote. And if voters are paying attention wh wherever they live, when it comes time to vote, hopefully they'll have enough information to vote for the best man or woman. Yes, ma'am. Um, can, I, can, can I ask you a question you promise won't take as mean-spirited? Do you think if Hillary or Barack were white males, you would call them Hillary and Barack? That's right. It's one of my little things. I, they get called that a lot. And, yeah. So you're saying, yeah. And John's a less, John is a less distinctive name, but I just find the like when, when I see people in the Bush administration referring to Condi, you know, they never would say about Donald. You know, you'd never have somebody on a Sunday show. Well, I think Donald makes a good point. They'd say Secretary Rumsfeld. Um, your question is, if they were white men, would he have a chance? You mean, is, is what gives him a chance the fact that he's a white man? Is that what you're asking? What gives him a chance is he's lived in Iowa for three years. He, he, he cannot be the nominee unless he wins Iowa. I think that's pretty clear. He won't admit that, but I think that's pretty clear. He, he ran strong there last time. He spent a lot of time there. Um, he, he, has, he has done a good job of driving the issues agenda by putting out specific plans on a lot of issues before the others. He's done a good job politically of talking about Iraq in a way that takes advantage of the fact that he's no longer a senator and, and he's under fewer constraints than they are. He's done a good job of courting labor unions. Again, he's, he's basically unemployed, so he has more free time uh, to go around and, and, and do all these things. It is clear that, that there's questions about whether the Democrats would nominate and the country would elect either a woman or an African-American. And I think there's, it's clear he will get some votes on that score. If he was doing better in head-to-head -head polls with the Republicans than they were, in some cases he does, but not uniformly, I think he'd have a stronger argument, even though he wouldn't make it explicitly on race or gender. But he's not. Senator Clinton 
if you look at all the polls, tends to do better. Um, I think that, that, that if you talk to the Obama people, they'll say it's a two-person race. And if you talk to the Edwards people, they'll say it's a two-person race. They acknowledge that Senator Clinton is the front runner, but they think they're going to be the alternative. No one has ever won a nomination effortlessly. There's always some near-death moment. Now, you could argue Senator Clinton might have already had hers a few months ago when Senator Obama was doing so well, but that's not what her people think, and, and they're probably right. So if Senator Edwards wins Iowa, he may eliminate Senator Obama, and he may get her one-on-one, -on -one, and one-on-one -on -one he may be able to beat her. But I don't think uh, – so, so I credit your point, which is to say – which is to say being the strongest white man in the field, e even within the Democratic Party, is probably a, an advantage for him. But it's not an overwhelming one. And, and I think increasingly you find members of the Democratic nominating electorate who like the thought of having a nominee who's not a white man. And, and Nett, I think her gender is an advantage for her, and I think his race is an advantage for him, which, if I'm right, mitigates the advantage that Senator Edwards has being the, the leading white male candidate. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, it's a, it's a huge problem for the country and for the Latino community. I think that it's an un, any, any, any cohort that underperforms its percentage in the electorate, I think, is a problem because it would be better for the country if everybody voted, but at least if everybody voted representatively. Young people vote less, Hispanics vote less. Um, uh, you talking about in the, in the nomination fight or in the general election? In the nomination fight, you know, none of the three of them have demonstrated significantly more, disproportionately more uh, support from Hispanics. There's some polls that suggest Senator Clinton has, but she's leading nationally, so it reflects that. I don't, I don't know that it will play a huge role. Um, if Senator Edwards gets the endorsement of SEIU, a labor union that has a pretty high Hispanic membership, I think th that you may see that reflected in, in union support for him and, and greater Hispanic support. But I don't think either nationally or any of the key states it'll play that big a role in the nominating fight as of right now, because they're all they're all in roughly the same place on issues, and 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 all have prominent Hispanic supporters and and are working hard for that constituency. In the general election, you know, Karl Rove and George Bush worked very hard to increase the percentage of the vote uh, for Republicans. They had some success, uh, certainly in Texas, and and some success nationally. Um, the, the the fight over immigration has been horrible for the Republican Party in that respect. I don't think any of the four, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say any, with the exception of Senator McCain, none of the other three leading candidates have shown either an ability or an inclination to reach out uh, to Hispanics in a way that way George Bush did. And I think there's some danger for them in the general election. You look at uh, New Mexico, Arizona, some other western states, uh, and some blue states where the Democrats could put red or purple states in play or lock down um, uh, 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 blue states and obviously Florida, if they, if they get a higher percentage of the Hispanic vote than John Kerry and Al Gore got, which is certainly possible. On the other hand, immigration is, is an issue which is, which is driven that to a large extent, not exclusively, and that may be a strong issue for Republicans because there's, there's tend to be non-Hispanic voters who prefer the Republican Party's position, not the President's position or John McCain's position, but, um, uh, but the, the dominant congressional wing of the party and, and most of the presidential candidates on that issue. And that could be a kind of a countervailing offset. I think there's no question the Democrats will win the Hispanic vote in 2008. I think they'll win it by more than John Kerry won it by. The question is how much more. And most Republican strategists I know are worried about that. McCain is an exception. It's a record of courting Hispanic voters in, in, in his home state of Arizona. And of course, he supports compre so-called comprehensive immigration reform. I think he, he might be able to do as much or maybe even more than George Bush did for competing, depending on who the Democrat was and, and what kind of outreach they engaged in. Well, there's always a debate about coattails and reverse coattails, um, um, and I have found it difficult because you never have a, you know, you never have a, 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 a parallel universe where you can say, well, here they had to run without this person. I think there's a couple things. First of all, the national issue environment, particularly Iraq, will have an effect on down ballot races without question. And 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 I'm surprised. I mean, the prediction that many people made that in September, now Republicans, particularly those up for re-election would 
uh, join Democrats in looking for a solution to bringing troops home from Iraq sooner has not turned out to be true. Most Republicans have su continued to support the President. It's likely the President's policies will continue well into next year and maybe through the election in a way that will endanger uh, a lot of Republican incumbents, uh, particularly senators, uh, Republican senators who represent blue states uh, in places like Maine and, and New Hampshire and, and Minnesota, just to name three. So that national issue environment, but particularly the issue of Iraq, uh, the, uh, if it's a change election, uh, it, both those things will probably benefit Democratic candidates. All the Republican presidential candidates are trying to be candidates of change. Um, uh, uh, Three of them don't currently serve in Washington. An easier argument to make, but still hard with an R after your name, trying to succeed a president. Very difficult to, to succeed a two-term president of your party, uh, particularly one who will almost certainly leave office with, uh, on election day, have low popularity numbers. So they're trying to be changed candidates. It is easier for them because they're not in Washington. It's somewhat easier for Senator McCain because he is iconoclastic in his views and, and has uh, advocated on a number of positions, uh, different uh, policies than President Bush. It is harder for down-ballot incumbent Republican candidates who have been serving in Washington and who have voting records of vote after vote in this era of partisan voting in, on behalf of the Bush administration in support of their policies. So I think the environment next year in general will not be good for Republicans. On the other hand, if Republicans successfully make particularly Barack Obama or uh, Hillary Clinton uh, um, very unpopular in particularly red states, particularly southern and western states, that may produce a large turnout uh, on behalf of Republican candidates voting against the top of the Democratic ticket, and, and if they vote the ticket, voting for Republican candidates. And that's something Republicans are counting on. They talk more about it in terms of Hillary Clinton because she is a person known to energize Republican constituencies. A lot of them think they can do the same with Barack Obama. They're just not prepared to talk about it yet. And most Republican strategists at the national level think she'll be the nominee. Sorry. And, um, and, and, and so they spend more time thinking about that. For those of you who don't know, California has, some Republicans in California are trying to get a ballot measure that would apportion California's electoral votes, 54 if I remember correctly, not winner take all statewide, but the way a few other states do it and the Constitution allows, um, uh, two electoral votes for the statewide winner, but then all the other electoral votes by congressional district. There are many congressional districts that are currently held, represented by Republicans under the, gerry, the gerrymand uh, that was done that are safely Republican. Uh, I don't think it will pass. Governor Schwarzenegger is not that enthusiastic about it. Uh, winning, uh, beating uh, ballot measures th that are close uh, with, with the no side tends to happen. In other words, people on something complicated tend to vote no. Labor unions will spend a fortune to kill it if it gets on the ballot, and they're spending a fair amount now to try to keep it from getting on the ballot. If it passed, there's almost no chance a Democrat could be elected president um, because they'd miss half of California's electoral votes or nearly half. And those are essential, and, and while, while it's not impossible, I, should, I maybe overstate the case a bit, um, it would put, put Democrats at such a severe handicap in trying to keep those electoral votes and try to win them district by district that it would drain a, a fortune away from them. So I don't think it will pass, and if, if it did, it would, but if it did, it would affect the general election mightily. It, it would, but they'd have, to, they'd have to think it from scratch, though, because you couldn't go campaign in all those congressional districts. You'd have to evaluate which ones you could win, and you'd have to figure out if you could offset the loss of some, because some you'd lose. I mean, there's some districts that are so gerrymandered the Democrat couldn't win them. You'd have to figure out how you'd offset those. Now, maybe, maybe you'd have surrogates do it. It's, it's hard to know, but you'd certainly, candidate time is, is the most valuable resource, but you'd certainly have to put some resources, more resources in California than you otherwise would. Back over here, yes, sir. Uh, huh? <laughs> um, you'd have to eat a lot more at breakfast at Cisco's because you look a little skinny. Um, well, you know, Jim, it was nice of Jim to, to introduce me that way, but um, uh, uh, over a decade ago I moved from Washington, D.C., where I grew up and where I'd worked, back uh, to New York City, to the Upper West Side, I like to say, because I want to be more in touch with the real lives of real people. Um, uh, 
You have to be more specific. You want to be, how do you be a political journalist or how do you be an insider? I mean, I, I've, I covered the 1988 campaign as a researcher. I've covered, I covered 1992 covering Bill Clinton. Probably I got where I am most simply because I was assigned by ABC to cover him in the, in the fall of 1991, and I spent uh, several weeks uh, as one of the only reporters and some days the only reporter covering him. And he ended up being a pretty significant political figure for, for a decade. And, <laughs> and I was able to use my, you know, my relationship with him and then his senior people who I met early on to know a lot of other people. And, and um, so that's one thing. Another thing is in this age when there's a lot of mistrust of the media uh, in terms of uh, conservatives for several generations thinking we're liberally biased and now a lot of liberals thinking we're corporatist and pro apologists for Bush, um, I'm proud of my reputation of being fair. Now, if you, if you Google me, you'll see that there are a lot of people who think I'm a Karl Rove apologist and a lot of people who think I'm a, I'm a socialist. So I don't, I don't necessarily take that as a badge of honor that both sides hate my guts, but, but it does, it's better than one side hating my guts as far as I'm concerned, and, and uh, although not better than neither. But, but within, within insiders, uh, I, I, I have good relationships with both Republicans and Democrats, and I take them seriously. I don't, I don't, I, I, in doing my work, I, I care a lot about fairness and about making sure that both sides feel like they're being represented and, uh, and that, be on both sides, all sides. Um, and finally, I'll say I just I work real hard at my job, a little less than back when I was younger. But um, but I think, as as Jim nicely said, I do take seriously not just the carnival aspect of American politics, but the fact that the purpose of this is to improve the real lives of real people and journalism's responsibility to hold public interests accountable uh, to the uh, hold powerful interests accountable to the public interest, and that inspires me to work hard and and. Generally, uh, uh, the Woody Allen thing about 90% of life is just showing up. If that's true, the other 10% is working hard, and, and I tend to do that. Is that, is that good enough? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Did you already have a question? Yes. Don't do that. Back there. <laughs> you had a question in an earlier class, or at least we talked in an earlier class. That counts as the same thing. Rare access to me. Yes, ma'am. They'll hiss you down if I did. That is an excellent question right out of my book. Um, and it goes to the question before about what she's taking from the, from the playbook of George Bush in particular. She could not win a referendum. She's an unusual presidential candidate. She goes into this race with tens of millions of Americans hating her guts. Poor Mike Huckabee is going to leave this race with tens of millions of Americans not even having heard of him. Um, so that's a problem. If the country had a national referendum, do you want Hillary Clinton to be president? I don't think there's a chance she could win that upper day. If there was, what she has to do is what George Bush did to John Kerry, make it a choice election. Would you rather have Hillary Clinton or Brand X? And Brand X will be one of these four Republicans, most likely, all of whom have problems. Uh, Senator Kerry, the reason James Carville thought that Kerry couldn't, couldn't win is because most re uh, re elections where there's an incumbent are referendums on the incumbent. Do you want George Bush for four more years or not? You know him. You know what he's going to be like. Do you want him for four more years? George Bush could not have won a referendum. In, in 2004, not even close. They made it a choice election. She will, she knows this, she will have to make it a choice election. One of the things they've taken uh, from, from the, uh, another, the tactical thing they've taken from Bush and Roe is you never waste a day to define your general election opponent, potential general election opponent, even before they're selected or you're the nominee. One of the huge mistakes that Al Gore and John Kerry and their staffs made were they couldn't decide how to run against George Bush. He's lazy, he's dumb. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's too right-wing, he's, he's, he's too moderate, whatever. They never settled on, on a negative frame, it's called, to describe him. Whenever you see someone from Hillary Clinton's campaign talking about Mitt Romney, they put it in the context of being a flip-flopper. He attacks her health care plan. They say, given his record of flip-flopping, maybe tomorrow he'll endorse her health care plan. Every time. And they do the same thing with the other candidates. It's a very smart, uh, very uh, 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 Rovian way to every time you get that megaphone, don't waste it and, and know that voters are, will latch onto one image. She cannot win a referendum, she can win a choice and that's what they're trying to do and they're trying right now to define the choice as a negative no matter who it ends up being.
back here. Yes, that's my that's my no look point. Um, you didn't already have a question, did you? I, I did not. Okay. Two questions. One, uh, as a journalist, uh, how important are stats? I mean, when you pay for voting, right? Bush, right. Harry, sure. At the end of the day, you're right. That. You're voting for Dan Bartlett. Good people, right? And um, your alma mater, the note, and its payday, I think, is really. Thing. It's Thank you. There's a little bit of gossip in it. I suspect it really serves your purposes because you mentioned some of the chapters in it. When you call and ask them, or, or someone from your world called and asked for help with others, or what not, they'd be happy to help you because you're always giving them a shout out. I'm not sure you've broken the code, but I won't deny what you're saying. <laughs> what happened to it? Yeah, it's tiny now. First reading, and my down over the political, I, yeah. I would suspect they are dominating that. Right. Well, although I'm still a consultant for ABC, I'm, I'm now, my primary job is I'm a, a, a Time magazine, and, and uh, doing the note was fun and good for, for a long period of time, but I decided I wanted to spend my mornings doing other things. And like I said, I'll have a new website soon that you, you might enjoy. But um, uh, uh, but it, it, you know, you can only do something for so long, mm -hmm. but I appreciate your kind words. I think staff's incredibly important. It, it is, it is, it is sometimes uh, the case that political journalists overstate the significance of not just the staff but of campaigns. There's the school of thought that says the more likable person wins, the taller person generally wins, not always, the person who's better on television. Um, and there's a lot of truth to that. If I were running for president, if you said you can have the best staff in the world or you can be really likable and really good on television, I would, I would take the latter. But in a close election, and we've had a number of close elections, and um, and in 2008, likely to be a close election. I think everything matters, including if you have a good, experienced, tight-knit, loyal staff. Um, the candidate can only do so much. And in fact, part of what goes wrong in campaigns that go wrong is sometimes you have candidates who try to do too much. The staff, uh, uh, particularly when you've got first-time candidates, and this time we have a lot of first-time candidates, the staff, if they're experienced people, uh, can, can, um, can make a big difference. One of the reasons Senator Obama has done so well besides his charisma and the fact that he's likable and tall and looks good on TV, is for, a, for an insurgent first-time presidential candidate, he has an extraordinarily experienced staff. Some of people he happened to work with when he ran for Senate who had previous or, or, or subsequent experience working on presidential campaigns, some of whom he's brought in. If you compare just the number of years logged uh, in presidential campaigns of his senior advisors versus, say, Howard Deans, it's not a close call. If, if, if this group of people who working for Senator Obama worked for Howard Dean, I think Howard Dean would have been the Democratic nominee. You can never prove it. If John Kerry and Al Gore, or uh, John Kerry and George Bush had swapped staffs in February of, of 2004, I, I, I'm not sure what would have happened, but, you know, most people think Kerry lost the campaign in three weeks in August, and I think Karl Rove might have done something different than, than the Kerry people did for those three weeks. The candidate's more important than anything else. The candidate's ideas, the candidate's biography, the candidate's relationship with the American people. But I think the staff clearly makes a difference in a close election. And again, another reason Hillary Clinton, I think, is having success is she's got a great staff. Really experienced, very loyal, very uh, uh, knowledgeable about the way to win. That's the title of my book, and I sneak that in whenever I can. Yes, in the back. If they were surprises, we wouldn't know about them. So I can't say for sure. Um, you know, I. I particularly with the camera rolling, I hate to say something this morbid, but given the, 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 the demographics of the candidates and, and um, overall, I, I think you could see a candidate drop out because of health. And I think any of these candidates getting out of the race now would have a pretty big impact on the field. Um, I think that the Republican Party is going to have surprises. There's, if you go back to modern history, the Republican Party has always had a front, an establishment front runner, and the establishment front runner has won the nomination every time. Now, it looked like that was going to be John McCain this time. He may well be the nomination. I've never written him off as much as some others. But he wouldn't have won it the normal route, and he's not going to win it, you know, in a cakewalk. So by, almost by definition and logic, the Republican race is going to be much different than we've ever seen. And, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I think there will be some surprises there. Um, I think that, that um, the, the calendar is going to be unpredictable. If, if I'm right about when Iowa and New Hampshire are, I think – you know, people say all the time this is going to be over so much more, so much earlier than ever because of the front-loading of the nomination calendar. Well, that's not really true in two senses. One is 
the nominees have effectively been picked by March all every every cycle I've covered, and sometimes even earlier. Senator Kerry, after he won New Hampshire, was effectively the nominee. The, this this race, if it's over in January, which it could be, will be over two months earlier. Two months is not that long a period of time. It likely go to February. That's one month. The other thing is, and this this could be a surprise for those who argue, and you hear this more than anything, that it will be over early because of the front loading. If different people win Iowa and New Hampshire, and different people win Michigan, different people win Florida, and then people split on February 5th, we may see a much longer nominating process. The front loading, rather than ending things quickly, if different people pick up delegates, the press is obsessed with early wins. But you don't get nominated by winning early. You get nominated by accumulating delegates. If we wake up on February 6th and more than one person in one or both parties has enough delegates to see the finish line, we may go all the way to June before they're nominees because no one wraps up the, the, the delegates. And on the Democratic side, as you all probably know, you have super delegates, the elected officials and former elected and party officials who get who get to be delegates automatically. They're pledged if they endorse, but they're not ironclad. And, and if somebody who you're pledged to drops out of the race, you're not you're not obligated to them. You could see some big some big swings, and you could see uh, again a, an elongated contest. That would be a surprise to someone who reads the papers and reads that this is going to end earlier than ever because of the front running, it will no longer be a surprise to anyone in this room because I just said it. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. You know, a couple reasons. One is what's unusual. Another thing that's unusual about this cycle on both sides is many strong candidates. Norm the normal dynamic is one front runner and then other people sort of competing to be in that second tier. On the Democratic side, for many months, you've had three candidates to get over. Uh, you could ask the same question you've asked uh, about Mike Huckabee, about Joe Biden, Chris Dodd, Bill Richardson, all with, on paper, better resumes than the three people in front of them, um, unless you credit Senator Obama, as you have experienced. Um, so uh, Mike Huckabee has to get over three people and now four people with Senator Thompson. There's in terms of fundraising, et cetera, it's hard to do. The other thing is, and I like Mike Huckabee a lot, and as I said before, I don't want to give short trips to these other candidates because I think it's important that voters have a chance to select a lot of people and for ideas to come forward, but that's the point. Name something distinctive about Mike Huckabee's agenda. I challenge you. I defy you because he has some distinctive views, but he's not presented them in a way that they've broken through. He's raised a pitiful amount of money. Now, some people can say, well, big money shouldn't decide it. Money donations are investments. Some, many from rich people, but also from the grassroots. If he really had an inspirational following, if he really was able to get forward original ideas that should affect the debate, if not be, make him the nomination, he'd be doing better. He'd be raising more money. He'd go into Manhattan and to Austin and, and tell people, here's the Huckabee agenda, here's why it's better than the agenda of these guys who are ahead of me in the national polls, and he'd be doing better. I haven't seen it. He's a nice guy, he's a, he's a good politician, but, but he's not been distinctive enough in his ideas, and ideas do matter even in the cynical age or in fundraising or any other indice he'd use except quips at the debate to show that, he, that he'd move up. I, I, my gut is he would not be picked as a running mate for reasons I will not say on camera. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, his most prominent connection to foreign policy has been things he said in debates and speeches that have been criticized by the media and foreign policy establishment as either too left or too right and not sophisticated enough. The campaign has not backed away from those. Uh, to use a gambling uh, metaphor, they've doubled down and said these views represent a new way of thinking and that if the foreign policy and media establishment doesn't understand these positions or appreciate them, it shows how out of touch they are, how linked to the um, uh, Rumsfeld Steinberg school of, of old political thinking that needs to be toppled. Um, uh, my sense is that he has not won that battle. I may be wrong, and, and I, I, it's not my place to, to evaluate it conclusively, but my opinion is that within, certainly within the chattering class, and I think within the wider electorate in Iowa and New Hampshire and other places that vote early, that, th that those conflicts have not produced 
uh, more confidence in people that he's ready to be president from day one. And you'll recall my view is that's what matters. Um, I think also he has he, – he, he did not, as everybody knows, he did not support the war originally. He did not vote to authorize it. Um, I think if you're a candidate of the future, you can only talk about the past so many times. And I think that although he was much derided for making the argument that Clinton's chief strategist Mark Penn is correct, that in the Senate their records are largely the same. Now this weekend he said he would no longer vote for any uh, money for the war that didn't include a timetable, which is how he just voted and how she voted. She hasn't said it to my knowledge as well, but I suspect that's how she'll vote. So in, in, in the recent past and going forward, I don't think he's going to be able to differentiate himself much from her on what is the dominant foreign policy issue for the Democratic electorate. And then again, within that wider um, uh, question of his foreign policy philosophy compared to hers, I don't think he's been able to differentiate it, except in cases where he's been seen as less adept and where she – not necessarily true, but that's how he's been seen – and where she has stepped in to call him naive and, and to try to stoke the impression that he's not ready to be president from day one because the Clinton people believe what I believe, which is that that's the greatest threat to his uh, having a chance to be nominated. I think that it is a – foreign policy in this post-Bush era is going to be a big wide open question. There's going to be a lot to define for any candidate or any uh, president. I don't think he's done it yet in a way that has helped his electoral chances. Yes? Can you uh, talk a little bit about your thoughts about the OA both the process? Yeah. Um, you know, most democracies have multiple parties. They don't have a two-party system. Um, and, 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 and we have two relatively centrist parties. And we don't have – we have a Green Party, which, you know, is not, is not particularly powerful in Washington or in very many states. We don't have a right-wing party that's particularly powerful uh, in any state. Um, and because we have two centrist parties, Unity 08's place to find uh, uh, traction is, I think, hard, hard to see. You got to get between two centrist parties and kind of squeeze them out. A lot of a lot of it is uh, is about competence and and about the gang in Washington, the partisanship. Finding a, a sort of grassroots, energized movement on the themes of partis of, of competence and anti-partisanship is difficult to do because most of the energy in our politics today comes from partisans, and uh, and and so I'm I'm skeptical that it can be done. Is there unhappiness with the two major parties? Are their brands in decline? Without question. Um, this is my Donald Rumsfeld, ask the question, answer it yourself. Um, is, is there room for a well-funded, charismatic person to come in and potentially uh, shake up the race? I think there is. But I think the only person who can do it, because he's the only one with the personal wealth, is Michael Bloomberg. Ross Perot got 19 percent of the vote, 19 million votes, with less money and being not necessarily the same um, – uh, having the same level of stability as Michael Bloomberg. But that was a much angrier time. The economy was much worse. You had an incumbent who was extraordinarily unpopular and a challenger about whom many people had questions. I think Unity 08 will require, I think, marrying up with Michael Bloomberg, but they'll also require two nominees, like Michael Bloomberg is looking for, who are seen as too partisan, too unpopular, too out of touch. And even then, you got to say, what are the issues? There's a, there's a, a group of people who are alienated from the um, – from the two major parties and their agenda. But some of them are followers of Ross Perot and, or Pat Buchanan, and some of them are followers of Ralph Nader, and some of them are followers of Ron Paul. Now, if you cherry pick their issue positions, there's some commonality, but on a range of issues, they're all over the map. And so how you actually build a coalition that could win 270 electoral votes, very hard to see, very, very hard to see, even under the best case, and, and chances are it wouldn't be the best case. And I'll say finally, as would happen with Perot, if an independent candidate has success, as Perot did at a time, was leading – many of you too young to know this, unless you've read a history book – he was leading in the polls in, in 1992 for a, time, for a time. If an independent candidate has success, they'll be talking about an issue agenda. The major party candidates will co-opt that. Bill Clinton started talking – one reason he won is he started talking about deficit reduction, about cleaning up Washington and getting things done in Washington, a little bit more nuanced on trade than he had been. Um, that's what will happen to a successful Unity 08 candidate. That he or she will be uh, pecked to death by the major parties taking away things that they think they can comfortably talk about to get back some of those things. Because in the end, people want to vote for a winner. And it's going to be hard to be convince somebody, except with the possible exception of Bloomberg, that you can win as an independent.
can't believe we got this long without someone asking. Um, it's really it's impossible to say. Um, I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts, uh, in, in particularly in terms of looking at the seven people uh, who are most likely to be nominated and, and what they'd be looking for. And then even with the camera rolling, I'll give you some specific names because people demand that and it's meaningless, so I'm happy to say it. In all likelihood, in the general election, for the first time in the modern era, um, the candidates will not be taking federal money for the general election. The way it's worked uh, since Watergate is, in the general election you get a check of about $65 million. You don't have to raise money for the general election. That's all the money you spend, and so the candidates are free to campaign for the, from the conventions till November. That probably won't be the case this time. Um, Senator Obama has said if the Republican would agree not to take, uh, to take the federal money, he would. So it could happen, but I think they'll all be looking for someone who can raise a lot of money because you'll want to be, send that person around to, to be a fundraiser. I think they'll all be looking for someone uh, who meets the test that Al Gore and Dick Cheney met, which is perceived by the media filter as ready to be president from day one. That it will be less about what region they're from or what state they can win, although that won't be insignificant in some cases, but about can they pass the test that Dan Quayle, fairly or unfairly, was unable to pass, but that Gore and, and Cheney did. And if you pick someone who passes that test but doesn't bring you any other immediately obvious electoral advantage, you get even more credit. Um, Bill Clinton got credit. He picked a, a guy who was his, rough, his, his generation from a neighboring state and the same ideological point of view. No balance of any sort, really. Um, uh, one handsome and one handsomer was really the only balance. Um, uh, Bush picked a guy who brought his three electoral votes from Wyoming, which is, as Dick Cheney likes to take credit for, but George Bush will tell you he likely would have won anyway. Um, uh, you know, no, no national political experience, uh, not particularly popular, you know, not a centrist, whatever. They got big credit for that. Um, I think it'll be somebody like that. It'll be somebody the press will say, that person could step right in. Um, and I think, I think in all likelihood, it, because if you look at these candidates with the exception of Senator McCain, all of them could use a little help on national security. It'll likely be an establishment figure who, who um, has a national security credential. You want me to ask me anything else, General, before I give you some names? If you ask me to pick, and again, I say the same names all the time, it's meaningless, so don't go to Vegas with this. I think Senator Clinton will pick uh, Tom Vilsack, former governor of Iowa, or uh, uh, Evan Bayh, senator from Indiana, former governor from Indiana. I think Barack Obama would pick Tom Daschle, who's an endorser of his and former Senate leader. Um, and I think all the Republicans will look at, and, and I'm not saying for the Senator Edwards only because I don't have a strong feeling about it. Um, all the Republicans will look at two people for sure for, for the fundraising part and because of a state, even though I said that would be less important, which is the current governor of Florida, uh, Charlie Crist. And if Hillary Clinton is the nominee, allowing the Republicans to have Bush Clinton Bush toss up, Jeb because Jeb is an incredibly good candidate, incredibly popular in the Republican Party, and you could probably count on Florida where he left off as very popular. And to be able to put Republican in the bank is, is great for the Republicans, and so I think, I think those two guys will get as much consideration as anybody. All the Democrats, I should say, will consider the current governor of Ohio, um, who's, uh, uh, who's still pretty popular, and, and, if, and if, he could, if they thought he could win Ohio, uh, they'd take him in a second. He's a, he's a, He's a uh, first-term governor, still pretty popular, as I said, and, um, and a good politician. One more. Sir? Uh, Is this a really good question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If he runs and he spends money, I think the Republican will win because I think he'll have to go win Democratic states. You know, if it's look, if it's Clinton and Giuliani, and I should say that the Bloomberg people don't necessarily agree with me. Uh, this is more my theory than theirs. But if it's Clinton and Giuliani, I think Bloomberg could win Indiana and Ohio against those two. Um, but if it's any other combination of candidates, I think again he'd have to try to win the Northeast, the West Coast. Uh, and, 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 and Democratic states in the Midwest. And I think, I think uh, he'd spend a lot of money. He's, he's an extraordinarily good politician. He's my mayor, uh, so, um, so I see him a lot. Uh, he's a great politician, and, he, and, and they would, you know, you can spend uh, $800 million smart, and you can spend it dumb. They would spend it smart. They're experts at micro-targeting. The guy got elected as a Republican, although he is a liberal Democrat by issue position, in a city that's five to one Democratic, 
He did it twice uh, by targeting voters. Uh, you would see ads everywhere in the country for him. You see direct mail. They do really smart things. But again, they'd have to say, how do we get to 270? Well, we start with Oregon, Washington, California. Then we do New England. We do Maryland, New Jersey. And, and to the extent he had success, he would be taking states and votes away from Democrats, I think. I think it would greatly increase the chances um, uh, because I think they'd have to fight. They'd have to devote a lot of resources to holding blue states. And I think it's possible if Bloomberg had a great deal of success, he'd be running negative ads. If you're trying to win a blue state, you're going to be running more negative ads against the Democrat. And even if you're running against them both in a blue state, you're costing the Democrat those electoral votes. Now, if he really had traction, he might keep anybody from getting 270, but not get there himself. And then it would go to the House, and I don't think he'd win in the House, although he could make nice donations to everybody in the House. Um, <laughs> it'd probably be the Democrat, because Democrats will you know, have the House. Um, but, um, uh, but, but to the extent he's in the race and trying to win, I think it hurts the Democrats for sure. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions. I've got a few more minutes if people want to come up, but otherwise I appreciate you all uh, listening. Nobody uh, that I saw fell asleep or checked an electronic device, which is impressive, so thank you.